three military recruiters showed up to address the high, the high school seniors. Each recruiter represented the Army, Navy, and the Marine Corps, was to have 15 minutes. But as typical blowhards, the Army and the Navy recruiters got carried away. And so when it came time for the Marine to speak, he had just two minutes. He walked up and stood utterly silent for a full 60 seconds, half of his time. And then he said this, I doubt whether there are two or three of you in this room who could even cut it as a, in the Marine Corps. But I want to see those two or three immediately in the dining hall when we are dismissed. He returned smartly and sat down. And when he arrived in the dining hall, those students interested in the Marines was a whole mob. One of the most powerful images for the U.S. military has always, has got to be the poster of Uncle Sam pointing his finger saying, I want you. At times of war and conflict, those posters were practically everywhere. The post office, grocery stores, with Uncle Sam telling everyone, everywhere, I want you. In the same way, throughout the entire Bible, God is saying to everyone, everywhere, I want you. In one of his letters, Peter declared, the Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants you. He wants you so badly that he paid a high price to recruit you. In fact, years before Jesus came to earth in mortal form, Isaiah 52, 10 prophesies that the Lord would lay bare his holy arms in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Centuries before Jesus came, God told his people that he would spare no expense to bring salvation. Back in 2007, there was a 14-year-old girl named Laura Montero whose appendix burst while she and her family vacationed on a cruise ship off the Baja coast. The ship was hundreds of miles from hell, and the crew sent out a distress call looking for the nearest surgical unit. The USS Ronald Reagan was about 500 miles away, and they answered the call. The carrier was in the midst of training exercises, but the crew of 6,000 stopped and turned its ship around and steamed 250 miles through the night to get within helicopter transport range. Laura was airlifted on board and the doctors performed the life-saving surgery. The cost, $2.5 million per day. Two and a half million dollars. That's a lot of money. How was that family ever going to pay for that? They're not. The cost was way too high, but the U.S. government believed that this little girl was worth saving. So they gave her a free gift of life. Two and a half million dollars. That's a lot of money, but God paid much higher price to obtain our allegiance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved us so much that he sacrificed the most important thing in the world to him. How are we ever going to 
pay for that. We're not. As Ephesians tells us, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. You can pay for that if you wanted to. The price was too high. But God thought you and I were worth saving. He wants you. So he gave you and I the free gift of life. So we are saved by grace. It's a free gift. God done everything to redeem us. But if that's true, does that mean there's nothing for us to do to accept his gift? There are people who teach that once God decides to save you, you're saved. And you don't have to do anything to be accepted. You're saved whether you want to be or not. The U.S. used to have a process like that. It was called the draft. Back during the Vietnam War, they had a kind of lottery, if you will, where 366 blue plastic capsules containing birth dates were placed in a large glass container and drawn by hand and assigned an order of call numbers. And that was assigned to all men within the age of 18 to 26 range as specified in the Selective Service Law. For example, if they pulled October 11th first, that date was designated as number one. And if you were born on that day of the year, you might as well pack your bags because you were in the Army now. But if you were born, say, October 12th, and that date was pulled out towards the end, say, 323, then you weren't likely to be drafted. You could enlist if you wanted to, but otherwise, you could stay at home. Now, one of the weaknesses of the draft was a lot of people who were selected didn't really want to go. There was no commitment in their part to do anything other than to survive the ordeal. Frankly, that's not a good way to build an efficient army. In fact, the draft was eventually so hated that it was discarded. And I doubt seriously that it will ever be truthfully used again. So does God draft us? Does God pick our number and declare us safe, whether we want to be or not? No. In fact, John 1 verses 12 to 13 explains that you and I can never be part of Christ's kingdom without making a conscious and deliberate decision for ourselves. Yet, to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In other words, according to verse 13, you could not become a Christian by natural descent. You could not be born a Christian. You could not just decide, hey, I'm good enough to be accepted by God. And you could not become a Christian by a husband's will. A husband can't decide his wife can be saved 
Nor can a wife decide for her husband. Nor can a parent make that decision for their child. According to verse 12, the only way you can become a Christian was to have received him and believe in his name. And in other words, you've got to sign up. You have to receive Jesus. But now how do you do that? How do you receive him? There are those who tell people you can receive Jesus by praying a sinner's prayer. They teach people who want to be Christians to pray, Jesus, come into my heart. Or something along that line. Now, this seems to have the advantage of being a quick and easy way to bring people into Christ's kingdom. But there is one small problem with this sinner's prayer. It's not in the Bible anywhere. The books of Acts gives us an example of people who became Christians in that day. And not one of those people ever became a Christian by praying, Jesus, come into my heart. It's just not in the Bible. This is a man-made doctrine. Well, if the Bible doesn't teach a sinner's prayer, what does it teach? Well, first, it teaches that we need to believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The most famous scripture that tells us this is John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There are a vast number of verses in the Bible that says the same thing in one form or another. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verse 21b tells us, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. In Acts 16, a jailer in Philippi is told by Paul and Barnabas, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And of course, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. You can, can't join the army of Jesus without believing that he is the Son of God and that he died on the cross to save you and rose from the grave to give you hope. If someone doesn't believe these things, they are not going to survive God in God's army. Revelation 12, 11 tells us that we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So, if you don't believe Jesus shed his blood for your sins, you will not survive Satan's attack. Now, is that all we do? Do we just believe? No. The Bible tells us that part of believing in Jesus involves repenting of our sins. Acts 3.19 says, Repent, then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshment may come from the Lord. In Acts 26, 20, Paul says, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. And when Paul preached his sermon on Pentecost, he told the believing Jews that what to do to be saved. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
To repent means to accept the fact that you are a sinner. And your life has to change. Repent means to turn around. You've been living your life without God. You've been walking away from Him. Turn around and live for Jesus. And that makes sense. Because Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2 tells us that before we became Christians, we were dead in our transgressions and sins in which, in which we used to live when we followed the ways of this world and of the rulers of the kingdoms of the air. We were, by nature, objects of wrath. In fact, Romans 5.10 says that at the time we were God's enemies. So in order to belong to God, we had to stop living like those who are his enemies. But there's more. Romans 10 verses 9 to 10 declares, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This is kind of like a loyalty oath. There are people who teach that this passage means you should confess your sins, but that's not what it says. What are we to confess? That Jesus is Lord. When you and I confess that Jesus was our Lord, we were declared He owns me. He owns my wallet. He owns my house. He owns my bank account. He owns my TV set. He owns my car. He owns my spouse, my children. Once you make those good confessions, you're declaring that Jesus will now own everything you have. Even the shirt on your back. Now, Jesus doesn't want the shirt on your back or your car or anything like that. But by making him your Lord, you and I gave him the deed to all of our possessions. This confession is sometimes called the good confession. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, Paul tells Timothy to take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. When Timothy became a Christian, part of what he did was make the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In fact, this is what we ask every believer to repent with us just before we baptize them. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 tells us that sooner or later, everybody's going to confess Jesus as Lord. God exalts Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. You can either confess him now or confess him later. But eventually everyone will do so. But you don't want to wait until he comes again. Because by that time, it will be too late. You'll still confess he is Lord, but it won't do you any good. Now, there's one more thing God asks us to do to belong to His Son. In 1 Peter 3, Peter talks about Noah's blood and then says, and this water symbolized baptism that now saves you also. 
not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is part of the Salvation Act, but there's no power in the water itself. There's no magical incantation recited to endow the baptismal water with power to change us. The power of baptism for salvation isn't in the water, but instead it is tied to the fact that God asked us to do it. You see, God knows we are a very visual people. For example, communion. Communion is a very visual part of our worship. The bread reminds us Jesus' body was broken for our sins. And the cup reminds us of his blood was shed to forgive us. In the same way, God made baptism a part of the salvation act because baptism helps us visualize Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6 says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus was baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Colossians 2.12 gives us a shortened version of Romans 6. It tells us that baptism is the outgrowth of our faith. It says we receive the fullness of Christ by having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Everyone who is baptized dies to sin. His dead body is buried in the water of baptism. And then he or she is raised up, resurrected from the grave to a new life in Christ. Back in 03, the Washington Post reported a surge in baptism among U.S. soldiers who were preparing to go into battle. The threat of war was having a positive impact on soldiers preparing for a possible conflict with Iraq. On a recent Sunday morning, eight young men approached the altar in a canvas church, received blessings from the chaplain, and were baptized in a freshly dug pool. They emerged to applause from their fellow Marines. Makeshift chapels throughout Kuwait in military camps and logistic bases was jammed with worshipers as they threat of war grew. Many of the men had not entered a church back home in years. Armory Chaplain Keith Kilgore, a Southern Baptist minister, said, it's the best ministry I've ever had. When soldiers are about to face combat, they start getting spiritual. They want to get right with God. Some troops say, this foxhole religion is critical to their preparation for war, saying it provides confidence that they will be protected if called upon to fight. And faith that their mission is just. Lance Corporal Matthew Hogan from California was one of those recently baptized back then. Hogan said, after today, I felt more ready to cross the border. This is better honor than anything the Marine Corps could give me. 
I feel better about myself than I ever had. I know God will be looking out for me. So, are you ready to cross the border? Have you made yourself right with God? God tells us the way to belong to Him and to be saved is simple. Believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sins and turn to God. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and immerse in the water for the forgiveness of your sins. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.